Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for the presentation of the Asian Development Bank's history book titled Asia's Journey to Prosperity, Policy Market, and Technology Over 50 Years. To formally begin our activity, may I call on PIDS President Dr. Celia Reyes for the welcome remarks. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we're very pleased to have our colleagues from the government, representatives from the academe, civil society, and the private sector um, in today's forum because this is going to be a very important, interesting one. Uh, we'd also like to thank, of course, our partner, the Asian Development Bank, for their um, uh, willingness to present their book titled Asia's Journey to Prosperity, Policy, Market, and Technology Over 50 Years here at PIDS today. The hard copy is not yet available. Uh, we do have an advanced copy there. It will be available by the end of next month, but the digital copy is already available uh, in the ADB website. And this is going to be a very important reference, I think, for economists, uh, social scientists, um, even for students and the general public, because it provides a historical perspective of Asia's transformational journey in the past half century. So it's going to be a good read, uh, not something that you can read in one sitting because uh, as you can see there, it's about 500, 600 uh, pages um, because it's a very comprehensive um, study. It's give, it gives us a glimpse of how the region managed to surpass challenges. Um, and so it's going to be um, a very useful reference in terms of how we have overcome these challenges, what are the best practices in the region, and how the other countries can make use of these lessons in further transforming their economies. So um, we're very pleased that uh, we have this with us this afternoon, Dr. Yasu Sawada, ADB's chief economist, and also um, Dr. Ju Zhong Zhuang, who is ADB's Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department Senior Economic Advisor, who have actually graced um, some of our previous seminars before, so we're very pleased that um, we have them again with us. And I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from today's discussion. So again, let me thank ADB for this opportunity, and we look forward to a meaningful discussion and productive open forum later. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sell. To give us the opening remarks, may we now have ADB's Chief Economist and Director General of the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department, Dr. Yasu Yuki Sawada. Good afternoon, ladies and Ladies and gentlemen, magandang hapon po. Uh, we are very happy to have here uh, today to share with you the findings of our latest corporate publication entitled Asia's Journey to Prosperity, Policy, Market, and Technology over 50 years. And uh, we'd like to thank uh, PIDS for this opportunity today. Uh, this book is a product of a three year long uh, study by uh, Asia Development Bank, ADB. Uh, led by its uh, Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department, ERCD, uh, which I, uh, I'm a head of um, uh, DG of uh, ERCD Research Department, and also involving a lot of ADB staff from various uh, uh, departments and offices. Actually, directly more than 50, 50 uh, staff members of ADB uh, have been involved in making this book and really a collective uh, product of uh, ADB staff members. And also, I'd like to note that the former president, um, uh, Takehiko Nakao, spent an uh, enormous type of time uh, uh, on uh, making this book, line by line editing, and also uh, uh, kind of hammering uh, this book. Mm -hmm. And uh, so some uh, in-house in story. Uh, towards the end, we have to spend a lot of time uh, editing and also revising and putting on different materials and updating data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So often we spend um, uh, uh, a lot of time at the uh, office of uh, president, uh, president office. Uh, uh, sometime uh, from 9 a.m. Uh, to 9 p.m. Um, uh, many days was like that. So we secretly call it um, boot camp. 
uh, exercise. <laughs> and uh, naturally, President, in order to incentivize us or keeping our energy, President started giving us a lot of uh, merienders. You know, ADB <laughs> has a very, <laughs> very good, uh, you know, cookie. Maybe, as you may know, ADB cafeteria has a very nice uh, cookie, cream cruise. So <laughs> often he provided uh, these uh, cream cruise and uh, merienda. So probably that's why we have a very thick, you know, fattened book of uh, 555 pages right now. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is a really uh, uh, corporate-wide uh, uh, product led by uh, former president. And um, uh, we have really a uh, uh, wide range of topics covered in one book. So we are really happy uh, to see this uh, output. Um, so some background, uh, in the 1960s when ADB was established, uh, ADB was established in 1966, uh, 54 years ago, and uh, at that time Asia was very poor, and uh, f feeding a large and growing population was one of the critical uh, challenges. At that time there was a, a big pes pessimism uh, uh, about the Asia's development uh, prospects, uh, prospects for industrialization, uh, broader development, and typically, you know, this uh, pessimism was uh, described in a um, uh, famous book by Gunnar Myrdals uh, titled uh, Asian Drama. Half a century on, or more than 50 years, uh, Asia has emerged as a center of global dynamism. Uh, and also now we see Asia is not only a, a global factory, but also a marketplace, Asia. Although we are now facing uh, some turbulence by uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic. Um, uh, this book uh, really attempts to uh, answer a um, uh, critical question, what can explain Asia's economic success in past uh, five decades? So this is the critical question we try to address in this book. Um, also, I'd like to uh, point it out, there are many studies on Asian development, and um, um, uh, particularly which is one, one book which is well known uh, by World Bank, East Asian Miracle uh, uh, Policy Report. Uh, this ADB book differs from the World Bank Miracle Report in largely speaking two aspects. Number one, um, our book covers a much wider range of countries and economies. Uh, as opposed to um, uh, Miracle Report only cover high performing uh, uh, Asian economies in East Asia and Southeast Asia only, but uh, we cover uh, especially China, and as well as Central Asia countries in Central Asia, uh, West Asia, and the Pacific region. Second differentiation or uh, unique feature from uh, East Asian Miracle book is our book covers a much longer time period, especially um, uh, 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 quarter century after Asian financial crisis, because um, uh, Miracle Book was published in 1993, so you know, nothing uh, 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 telling about uh, uh, Asian financial crisis and uh, reforms after that and uh, further sustainable uh, development, we are now observing uh, not only in East and uh, uh, you know, um, uh, high performing uh, newly industrialized economies, but also China and Southeast Asian countries and lately, we observe a very strong uh, growth momentum in South Asia. So I think these things uh, um, are new. And uh, actually, uh, is there a, can you upload the slides? So I'd like to uh, quickly uh, show what kind of uh, topics and issues um, addressed in this uh, book. Yeah. So this is a table of contents. And uh, um, we have uh, 15 um, uh, chapters. Chapter one, if you don't have time, uh, please read the chapter one and the chapter two. <laughs> That's uh, really a summary of uh, our old book. But uh, chapter two and onwards, 14 chapters covers uh, 14 different themes. Uh, chapter two is on uh, market, state, and institutions. This is a really broad uh, framework uh, with uh, some nice uh, uh, data and also country studies. Um, chapter three is on structural transformation, agriculture, modernization, and rural development uh, is uh, chapter uh, number four. Technical progress, chapter five. Education, health, and demographic change, chapter six. Investment, savings, and finance, chapter seven. And uh, chapter eight, infrastructure development. Um, right side, uh, chapter nine, trade, uh, 
FDI and openness, some uh, external uh, uh, issues. And um, uh, chapter uh, uh, 10 is on macroeconomic stability. Chapter 11, poverty reduction, income distribution. Uh, chapter 12, gender and development. Uh, 13, environmental sustainability, climate change. 14, bilateral, multilateral development finance. And the final chapter is devoted to regional cooperation and integration in Asia. So you can see a much, much broader scope than other comparable uh, books and uh, studies on Asian development. Notably, we have a chapter on gender, environment, also infrastructure, and foreign uh, support and bilateral, uh, multilateral development finance, as well as regional cooperation and integration. So these are the really uh, uh, much wider coverage uh, uh, than uh, existing uh, books and publication on Asia. But uh, with that, uh, I, I'd like to now call on my colleague, uh, Dr. Juzon Zhang, Senior Economic Advisor, uh, to give an overview of uh, this publication covering uh, this uh, main uh, uh, ingredient. Uh, we will be happy to answer to the question after his presentation. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, you see, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a challenging job to present a 600-page long book within 20 or 30 minutes time. So, uh, my presentation will, uh, you know, focus on these uh, four issues. The first is uh, Asia's key development uh, achievement, very briefly. And then we look at what can explain Asia's economic success. And thirdly, we will highlight a few issues, basically, that are often he heavily debated in the literature. Uh, for instance, is Asian development unique? Uh, is low, what is the role of the industry policy? And can industrialization be bypassed? And the importance of institutions. And finally, uh, we'll very briefly go over you know, Asia's challenges ahead. Uh, OK, so first, um, Asia's key uh, uh, key development challenges. Uh, basically, uh, uh, during the last uh, 60 years or so, from 1960 to 2018, uh, developing Asia, developing Asia here, we basically were referring to uh, 46 uh, ADB's developing uh, member economies in, in Asia and the Pacific. So the, the developing Asia's per capita GDP grew at 4.7% uh, annually. Uh, from 1960 to 2018. Uh, so, of course, growth uh, 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 varies across period, and the highest uh, is the uh, 2000s, 6.2%, uh, uh, percent, and uh, after China joined the WTO. And uh, so the overall, the per, this is a per capita GDP, uh, per capita growth. Uh, if you look at the total GDP growth uh, during this period of time, is about 6.4% because the population growth is 1.7%, 1.7% so annual population growth. So annual GDP growth is 6.4%. Uh, 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 so this is a very impressive growth uh, uh, performance. Global growth during this period of time, per capita GDP growth for the world, world as a whole is less than 2%. So issue performance is very impressive. And of course, uh, rapid growth led to uh, rapid rising in Asia's uh, uh, share in global GDP. So developing Asia's share in global GDP increased from 4% to 24% during uh, about 60 years time from 1960 to 2018. But if we include Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, and Asia's share rose from 13% uh, to 34%. So it's basically now we are one third, Asia is one third of the global economy. And there were also significant, uh, significant improvement in broader development indicators driven by economic growth, largely. And of course, they are also targeted at social policy and inclusive growth policy. So if, if you look at this table, extreme poverty rate declined from about close to 70% in 
1980 to uh, less than 7% in 2018. Life expectancy at birth increased from 45 years to close to 72 years from during the period of 1960 to 2018. And infant mortality rate for per, per thousand uh, live uh, uh, births declined by 80% during the same period of time. And the mean years of schooling for population aged 20 and 24 increased from three and a half to close to nine years. So this is, these are the very impressive growth and development performance. So the question is what can explain issues economic success? So obviously many factors are at play. Uh, so in the, in the book we highlight these are the, uh, in the list. First is the peace and stability, especially after the Vietnam War. Uh, so the region you know, by and large maintained way in peace and maintained stability especially after the Vietnam, uh, uh, Vietnam War in 1975, uh, 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 especially we compare with the previous 50 years or previous 100 years. So this is very important and provide the basic condition for sound development. Secondly is the favorable demographic conditions. So peace and stability led to rapid population growth and then created the favorable uh, demographic conditions. So during, uh, during this period of time from 1960 to 2018, the region's uh, uh, working, working age population increased from about 50% to 70%. So that create a uh, significant amount of a demographic, called a demographic dividend. And the third is that uh, by and large, most advanced countries during this period of time maintained free trade and investment policy. So in a, this, these policies enabled Asia and Asian economies to benefit from globalization and from technology progress. And the fourth day is this low income level, obviously we know this convergence process provided potential for catch up growth, right? So now in the book we argue that even with peace and stability, even with favorable demographic and external conditions, the catch-up growth will not be automatic, will not be automatic. So basically, we argue that uh, Asia's economic success owes much to creating better policies and stronger institutions. So this is a key message. Basically, Asia's ex economic success in the last half century owes much to creating better policies and stronger institutions. So now what are these economic, uh, what are these bad policies? Basically the presentation, because uh, Yasu mentioned that we have 14 chapters, so in order to make the presentation manageable, we uh, summarize this, uh, all these uh, different chapters into eight policy drivers, eight policy drivers. The first policy driver is that the, rely, the first is relying on markets and private sector as engines of growth with proactive state support to adjust market failure. So the number one. So uh, in the last half century, we know that uh, uh, you know, economic, Asian economic development policy shifted from state-led industrialization to market-oriented growth. So the period after the Second World War can be roughly divided into five phases, five phases. The first phase is from late 1940s to late 1950s. So this period is characterized by post-war political independence, you know, independence from former colonial powers and reconstruction and the start of state-led industrialization and import substitution policy. So this is a period. The second period, the second phase is from late 50s to late 70s. That time, Japan and the Four Tigers, Four Tigers basically, uh, Thailand, uh, sorry, uh, Korea and uh, Singapore, uh, uh, Hong Kong, China, and uh, Tibet, China, right? So the Four Tigers, Japan and Four Tigers, they shifted to export promotion policy and market led growth. So from late 50s to late 70s, uh, but at the same time, China and India were still under state control and uh, inward orientation, orientation policies. Uh, and many in, in many other countries. China, of course, is socialist uh, industrialization, essential planning, Soviet type. 
Now then from late 70s to early 90s, we know that East Asia, you also mentioned of East Asian Medical Study, World Bank, the East, East Asian Medical were fully recognized. So East, East Asian Medical basically included Japan and four tigers plus Malaysia, Thailand, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, Indonesia, right? So that story was fully recognized. And then with the same time, there was the first wave of opening and market-oriented reform in China, in Vietnam, India, in Central Asia. Central Asia, of course, that time still was part of the former Soviet Union, but you know, reform, uh, perestroika, and the glasnost, uh, so it started a kind of reform. Then from early 90s from to up to 2007, uh, there was broadening of opening and market-oriented reforms in these countries, in these economies, and the, because of the improved the prospect, there were growing trade and capital flows, uh, but region suffered from Asian financial crisis in 1997. Uh, then after crisis, uh, the recovery was sweep uh, with fast, and uh, there were big efforts to, to reform, to introduce post-crisis structural reforms, right? So that, uh, uh, especially in crisis-fed countries. And finally, the fifth phase is from 2008 to present. There was a global financial crisis in 2008, and uh, but because Asia, you know, post-Asian post, post financial crisis reform made Asia resilient, so Asia weathered the global financial crisis well and uh, so far has led global growth. And in, in the meantime, there is an increasing focus on inclusive growth because of the rising income inequality in many countries and good governance. And there was also a less thinking on the role of the state in overcoming market failures. So these are the broad, uh, you know, uh, 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 60 years or even longer, 70 years, five phases that we, we try to look at. So basically, the view of this experience suggests that uh, there are two conclusions that we want to draw. First is that market-oriented reforms and opening to the outside world uh, were always followed by a rapid economic growth, acceleration of growth, after reform introduced and the growth accelerated. And the second is that while markets and the private sector were engines of growth, the state remains proactive in promoting development in most, in many Asian economies. So basically, what we, 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 our conclusion is that sustained growth and poverty reduction require first efficient markets, and then we need an effective state as well as strong institutions. So that is chapter two about you also mentioned uh, that we also recommend to you to read if you don't have time to read the entire book. <laughs> so the second uh, policy driver, you know, uh, uh, is that the promoting structural transformation. So structural transformation we know is the primary driver of economic growth, whether it is developed countries or developing countries. So a starlight effect about structural transformation is that over time, resources are transformed from agriculture to industry, industry sector up to a certain point. We know that up to a certain point. You can see from the chart on the, on the, on the right-hand side. A and the two services, so within each sector, each of the three sectors from low to high productivity productions. So structural information is about resource transfer from three broad sectors and also the improvement of productivity within each of the sectors. Now, issue of course is uh, follow the broader patterns is no exception, but the pace is very fast, much faster than historically uh, com compared to other countries. So, uh, for instance, from 1970 to 2018, uh, developing issues, agriculture employment share declined from 71% to 34% uh, industry share increased from 14 to 20, about 26%. This is employment share. Service in, uh, employment share increased from 15% to 41%. So the pace is very rapid. Uh, now, so as I said, the structure, structure, structure transformation also involves more from resource mode, more of resources from low productivity production within each of the three broad sectors, slow technological progress. So basically, Asian economists, uh, in order to promote technology progress, they first adopt the foreign technology, first adopt foreign technology, then begin to innovate their own. 
And they use a variety of ways. For instance, by inviting experts from abroad and sending students abroad. And by foreign license, importing machines, and promoting trade and FDI, and conducting reverse engineering, and of course, investing in R&D. So now the middle chart shows uh, uh, the, the top five economies, top five economies globally, in terms of the number of the patents granted in the United States. Right? So we look at, uh, so basically what we're saying, I want to make, sure, make, make, make the point that the, at the progress in technology advances in developing Asia has been very rapid. So as I said, the, this chart is the top five economies globally in terms of the uh, number of patents granted in the United States in 60 and in 2015. In 60, for instance, top five globally, or mostly from uh, uh, four of the four of the five are from outside Asia, including Germany, United Kingdom, France, uh, Canada. Japan is the only one from Asia. And in 2015, instead of one, it is four from Asia, including Japan, Republic of Korea, Tibet, China, and the PRC. Only Germany is from outside. So basically. Asia has be, uh, 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 transformed itself from a major user of the falling patents and into a producer of patents as well over the last half century. So now the, uh, the right-hand side char uh, chart is basically shows the results from de gross decomposition. Uh, in 70s, the 80s, Asia's growth was driven, mainly driven by mobilization of resources, right? For physical capital and labor and human capital. But over time, the importance of TFP, we know all TFP. TFP growth reflected technology advances and also improving efficiency. So TFP growth became more important. In 2010 to 2015, uh, 17, the last basically last eight or seven years, uh, TFP growth accounted for 40% of, contributed 40% of Asia's growth. Equivalent, the same more is the same as the contribution from physical capital. So the technology progress has been very important. The third driver is, uh, I want to, we want to highlight is investing in productive capacity. So high growth Asian economies all made a larger investment in physical capital and that capital investment were largely financed by domestic savings. So the table shows that uh, from 1960 to 2017, the physical capital stock for developing Asia as a whole increased from four trillion US dollar to 176 trillion US dollars. So that is in 2001 constant US dollar, and growing at about close to 7% annually. Uh, the highest growth is in China, 8.3%, but other region, other sub-regions grows also very high. You know, the uh, South Asia, for instance, 5.7%, Southeast Asia is uh, 6%. So, so, and then the, uh, the right-hand side chart shows it, uh, it basically uh, uh, the, this investment funds largely by domestic savings. So over the, over the, over the last uh, 60 years time, uh, the developing Asia's gross domestic savings rate increased from 18% to uh, 41%. So, you know, from 18% to 41%. Uh, notably, after 1990s, uh, the, the region's uh, savings rate, domestic savings rate, exceeded the domestic investment rate. So that means uh, we are running over the region as a whole, running con uh, current account surplus. Of course, there are larger across country valuations. Many uh, South Asian countries, for instance, still running current account uh, deficit. Uh, a key part of physical capital investment was for infrastructure, right? Including transport, power, water, sanitation, and telecommunication. So for instance, during uh, 1971 to 2018, per capita electricity generation increased by 35 times in Korea, 30 times in China, 19 times in Thailand, 14 times in Malaysia, and nine times in, uh, in India. Uh, in comparison, that number is only doubled in OECD countries and tripled for the world as a whole. So large infrastructure investment alleviated production networks, uh, bottlenecks, and improved living standards. 
The fourth policy driver is to build human capital. So many Asian economies made efforts to build, it, to build human capital, especially to expand education by making education a basic right and through compulsory education program and investment in schools and uh, education reforms. So during 1970s, 2010s, developing Asia's public spending on education increased from 2.1% of GDP to 3.6% of GDP. Of course, I have to say this number is still lower than global average. Global average is 4.5%. Uh, public spending in education contributed to rising school enrollments at all levels. So we know that uh, most of Asian countries' economies has already achieved the universal access to the primary schools. And uh, many achieved the universal access to secondary schools. And uh, there were also significant expansion in the tertiary education. So uh, expanding education obviously boosted productivity and improved people's well-being. Fifth policy driver, open trade and investment. High growth economy, Asian economy, all maintained open trade and investment regimes. So I, I, as I mentioned earlier, in the 50s, uh, the region basically, the, the import substitution industrialization strategy the dominant, right, at that time. Because of the influence by desire to take independence, uh, because of the economy get political independence, but they also want to get economic independence. Uh, they want national industry, so imported substitution. And also there was shortage of foreign exchange. So in, imported substitution, uh, industrialization strategy was dominant. But over time, the region moved on to uh, export promotion, and open trade and investment. So from 60, the, 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 the four tigers, as I mentioned, four tigers moved to extra promotion from 60s, and several Southeast Asian economies, including Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia from 70s, China and Vietnam from 80s, and India from 90s. So these, uh, over time, they moved to, uh, from important substitution and inward orientation towards open trade, open investment, and openness. Uh, so they initially, in, uh, you know, uh, especially they promote manufacturing. So they initially promoted the exports of labor-intensive manufacturing products, and over time moved up to uh, export more sophisticated, uh, uh, sophisticated products such as cars, electronics, and machines. And in the last two to, uh, two to three decades, they many more and more economies participate in the global value chain. So that chart basically shows. Uh, uh, on the left hand side shows the composition of the exports, merchandise exports, you know. So in the 60s, uh, the export dominated by textile labor intensive, right? Now it's dominated by electrical machines, electronics, and, 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 uh, and cars, appliances. So there's a significant shift in composition of exports. And uh, to attract the FDI, so many economies, they set up a special economic zone, and provide tax incentives, and uh, so, and making developing Asia one of the most attractive FDI destinations. Uh, now the region account for 35% of the world total inward FDI. This is about uh, in 2017 figure. Six uh, policy driver is maintain, maintain macroeconomic stability. So compared with other developing regions, Asia did better in macroeconomic management whether you look at growth fluctuation, whether you look at inflation, or whether you look at frequency of economic crisis. So Asia, development Asia compared to other developing regions, for instance, Latin America or Africa, we, had, uh, we have a lower growth fluctuation, we have a lower inflation, we have a lower frequency of economic crisis. Of, of course, the uh, Asian financial crisis, uh, Asian financial crisis in, in 1997 is a big setback, right? So, and caused by uh, the currency and maturity mismatch and inefficient, inefficient investment of following borrowings. But after the crisis, the recovery was sweet, was fast, and many economic countries engaged in start implement structural reforms to make the economy more resilient. So basically, the good macroeconomic uh, management, management provided the basis for sustained growth and reform in response to the Asian financial crisis laid the foundation 
for future resilience. So region weather the global financial crisis as well, as I mentioned earlier. Now the seventh policy driver is uh, uh, promoting social inclusiveness and uh, gender equality. So we know that uh, policy deduction mainly driven by rapid uh, economic growth, right? So I mentioned about the deduction in extreme, level, in extreme poverty from 70% to 7% now over the last half century. So, and that chart shows the positive correlation between economic growth and the pace of poverty reduction. And uh, so that is, uh, of course, apart from economic growth, there are also targeted policies, targeted social policies, the inclusive growth policies, as I mentioned, including land reforms, including uh, uh, green revolution in the agriculture sector, introducing 60s and 70s, and investment in education, as I mentioned. Uh, but uh, the region's performance is poverty reduction. On the other hand, the region's performance in reducing income distribution, in improving income distribution, in reduce income inequality, the performance is more mixed. So we know that in 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, Asia had a stable inequality, right? And uh, uh, pattern normal, we have a rapid growth, but the inequality is stable. So a pattern, World Bank, uh, World Bank East Asian Medical Study, also many other studies refer to this as a growth with, with equity. This is in East Asia. Uh, but since 1990, growth, you know, more and more countries uh, joined the high growth, you know, the, 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 the rank, but uh, has been accompanied by rising income inequality in some economies, like in China, in India, in Indonesia. So more recently, uh, many economies in Asia considered the in promoting inclusive growth as a part of a growth strategy or development strategy. So that is uh, the seventh uh, point. Uh, now the sixth is uh, policy, uh, the eighth policy driver is engaging with development partners and uh, promoting RCI. RCI means regional economic integration, cooperation and integration. So Asia benef benefited from engaging with bilateral partners and MDBs, multilateral development banks, in implementing development, development projects, especially infrastructure, education, and health. So for instance, in South Asia and Southeast Asia, development assistance financed about 10 to 20% of gross domestic investment in the 70s and 80s. So it's quite significant. For the developing issue as a whole, is about uh, four, five, or six percent, to depend on different period of time. So now, of course, more recently, because of increasing FDI, uh, so the the you know the this basically the net capital inflows by non-residents. So this is capital inflows by non-residents. So that as a share development assistance, development finance, we we call the net official flows as a share of total, uh, as a share of gross domestic investment actually, uh, declined, the share declined, but absolute amount is still increasing. And of course now the, uh, uh, but, but such a partnership remain relevant because uh, now, the, now MDBs uh, provide uh, finance, but also policy advice and knowledge product, not knowledge sharing. So this is the main important. And then finally is this engaging with uh, there's a, uh, you know, there was a neighbors that promoting uh, regional cooperation and uh, integration. That uh, ASEAN also, uh, also played an important role in supporting Asian development by contributing to peace and stability and uh, to intro regional you know, trade and investment and uh, in provision of local regional public goods. For instance, in 2018, close to 60% of Asian trade were among Asian countries, Asian economies. And then 50% of FDI inflows were from within Asia and the Pacific region. So the intro regional trade, intro regional FDI become very important. So other than that is the eight policy drivers I tried to summarize and uh, you know, so now we uh, I turn to the third part of my presentation, basically try to look at a few issues which are often debated, you know, uh, in the literature. The first issue is, is Asian development unique? is Asian development unique. Now, we know that the many studies, many scholars often consider Asian development experience unique, right? And then, or there is an Asian development model often, uh, you know, the mentioned Asian development model, 
which emphasize the law of the state intervention, law of the state and state intervention, uh, as opposed to the so-called Washington Consensus, which is more, you know, follow closely with the standard economic um, theory of market economy, Washington Consensus, right? So the question is, you know, whether there is a is Asian Development Union. So the, the book, in the book, we argue that Asian economies implement policy and reforms that are not very different from standard economic theories of the market economies or Washington Consensus policy recommendations. In this sense, Asian development is not unique. If we look at the 10 policy, uh, uh, policy recommendations of the Washington Consensus, Asian, many Asian economies made efforts to introduce fiscal prudence, right? Fiscal prudence and to reform public expenditure and tax reform and to liberalize the financial sector and to make, to make exchange rate more flexible and to liberalize imports and FDI. And some countries, some kind of privatize SO, state-owned enterprises and deregulate business, uh, you know, in, uh, that uh, re regulation and uh, to also protect public rights. So these are the kind of, uh, these are from the policy, 10 policy recommendations of the Washington Consensus. So these are the more or less Asian economies followed, right? However, what made, we argue that what made many economies, Asian economy unique is a gradual approach and a pl uh, pl uh, uh, problematic uh, approach in implementing these policy reforms, right? So they are gradual approach and programmatic, you know, they are problematic in implementing this policy reform, including the practice of testing and piloting major policy changes before full-scale implementation and also careful sequence. For instance, uh, in China, the start, uh, the agricultural reform started with, the, uh, you know, the, the introduced uh, uh, household responsibility system. So they first piloted in few provinces and before state, uh, uh, the countrywide implementation. And the plus reform started with uh, 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 the dual track, with the dual track system, not just liberalize, you know, one go. The first is dual track, and if you have the market price and the plant price, and uh, gradually they merged. This. So that's kind of gradual, uh, a gradual approach. And uh, pro-mechanism, for instance, uh, 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 so the many Asian economies legalize, before you liberalize your capital account, you first have to make your domestic financial system sound, right? Before you, before you can open capital account. And, uh, and, and uh, so these are the kind of uh, examples of, you know, the gradual approach and uh, programmatism in implementing policy reforms uh, that make Asian economy unique. So that is the first, first issue. The second issue is the role of industrial policy. You know, this is uh, another contentious issue. So many, we know that many Asian economies use industrial policy uh, to promote the development so industrial policy, there is so-called horizontal industry policy and the vertical industry policy. Horizontal industry policy is nationwide, like education, support education, infrastructure, or IND. Uh, uh, the horizontal industry, we know that the everybody agree, work uh, by, in, you know, the well in all the uh, economies by improving business environment, education, as I said, education and uh, the, improve, uh, the in, uh, infrastructure investment. But a targeted industry policy you know, or vertical industry policy often targeted a specific sector or specific firm uh, has been more controversial and the results are mixed. Some success, some failures. Uh, of, of course, we know that after Asian financial crisis, the targeted industry policy was discredited and considered as a part of the causes of Asian financial crisis. But targeted industry, industry policy more recently received the renewed attention. I mean, especially after the global finance crisis. Now, in the book, we argue that the targeted industry policy, if used badly, can lead to rent-seeking, unfair competition, and inefficiency. But if used wisely, it can be effective, especially in areas where with a strong uh, spillover effects, like, like innovation, right? And with where the area where coordination problems is a problem, coordination. For instance, you start a new industry, 
new, new activity. So where, you know, you often you need uh, just uh, one firm, but also, you know, entire upstream, downstream, so you need a better, good coordination. So that kind of uh, scenario of the areas uh, that if you, you know, use wisely, uh, the targeted industry policy can be effective. Now, targeted industry policy is more likely to succeed if it is performance-based and uh, promotes competition. We have a clear targets, sunset clauses, and transparent implementation rules. For instance, in Korea, in 60s, 70s, they have export targeting. So export targeting often, you know, the basic firms give a, uh, that time foreign exchange is short. So they will firms get a preferential allocation of foreign exchange if they reach certain export performance targets. So that kind of, right? If you cannot reach the targets, and then the, the kind of preference will be withdrawn. So that, that's what, that kind of performance-based, uh, uh, you know, target, uh, target industry policy can work. And then the subsidy, for instance, cannot be for, forever, it temporarily. Uh, the infant industry, for instance, consolidation at the start, you, you know, you protect, but the lay, gradually you should remove this and you, you, you should promote competition. So that is, uh, 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 you know, the, the some conditions. And uh, I also believe that as a country becomes more developed, industry policy should focus more on supporting R&D to promote technology innovation that are less intrusive. Uh, I think that is Japan's case. Japan industry policy in 50, 60, uh, you know, 50 especially, targeted industry policy is very, uh, you know, the important. But over time, they moved away from targeted industry policy from 60, from 70 especially, focus more on R&D support and uh, innovation. So that is kind of uh, our view on the role of industry policy. The third issue is, can industrialization be bypassed, right? So, uh, as I mentioned, the many Asian economies achieved high growth by promoting manufacturing and exports. They achieved high growth by promoting manufacturing and exports, and they used a variety of ways to make promoting manufacturing. For instance, the larger capital investment I already mentioned, and investment in R&D and open to trade and FDI, and education, skill training, and set up a special economic zones of export processing zones. So these are the ways, and then you can see from this chart uh, in NIEs, the newly industrialized economy, with the four tigers. You now the, the the employment. This is manufacturing employment, uh, manufacturing employment, total employment share, is very high. Uh, in eight days, it reached 30 percent NIEs, and of course recently they declined a, lot, uh, a little bit, uh, but it's still very high, more than 25 percent. Um, of course, this economy not experienced de-industrialization, de 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 as many other advanced countries experience, right? In China, now manufacturing employment is about 25%, so it has been increasing over time. Uh, India increases less, and ASEAN 4, ASEAN 4 is basically here, Malaysia, uh, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines, ASEAN 4. Uh, I think Malaysia is in, in manufacturing employment is high, but the Philippines is low. I think at the moment it's about 15% or even less. So, yeah. So basically, it, it, you know, the, the high growth economy all promoted manufacturing. And then the right hand side of the chart show the positive correlation between export growth and economic growth. So you have high export, high GDP growth is often associated with high export growth. So the export, is, is, of manufacturing good, right? So th that, that. Uh, then, the, but more recently, uh, you know, uh, experience, some country experience like India and the Philippines uh, show that the service sector can also contribute to high growth, right? The, the Philippines uh, business processing, outsourcing, that is very important, contributed to growth, and India the same. Uh, then there's the question whether industrialization can be bypassed. That issue has been discussed, highlighted. Now, we in the book, we did not make a definite answer, right? we did not. But the noting uh, a number of factors. The first is that historically, we know that manufacturing was important almost in all high eco income economies worldwide, right? 
before they start the deindustrialization. So all high, not, not high advanced economy, historically, they developed manufacturing set. Manufacturing set was very important, right? Before the deindustrialization at the start. So now, and the second one is that, the second point is manufacturing has certain important features. The first is that, uh, I mean, th these are the features that they are tradable, right? More um, compared to the service sector, right? They are tradable and they can earn foreign exchange, right? This is important. And they have a high income elasticity of demand. So that means as a country become rich, the demand will increase for manufacturing, right? So this is very important. And because not just the country, but also global, if the world become rich, demand will increase in manufacturing, that is the future. And uh, they have a large scope for innovation. So even the service sector information, innovation relying on manufacturing set, right? The platform IT all relying on manufacturing. So, so there's a larger scope for innovation and also scale economy. Manufacturing enjoy scale economy and uh, important that also create better paying jobs. They can pay a large amount of jobs. So, so these, are the, these are the important features of the manufacturing. On the other hand, the book also noting that uh, in recent years, innovation is also happening and the pace is increasing in service sector. Service is also <laughs> increasing, and uh, and and uh, and uh, you know. So the question is uh, like uh, you know the platform, uh, the digital, the digital economy, uh, mobile payment, and e-commerce. The, the, the service side is also happening. But the question is uh, whether industrialization can be bypassed. So we did not provide the definite answer, but the question, of course, uh, the issue is there and the time will tell and then we can discuss whether the Philippines, for instance, uh, what is experience uh, in terms of manufacturing versus, uh, manufacturing versus service sector. Uh, I think I just skipped this uh, chart uh, because time. So the fourth uh, part is the challenges because this is a history book. So we did not really go into too much detail into the future challenges. We only have uh, small section on uh, looking ahead, right? So each chapter. But uh, anyway, the challenge is basically, uh, you know, uh, despite significant improvement, impressive development, issue development gaps with advanced countries remain large. For instance, in 2018, developing issues per capita GDP was only 13% of OECD average level. So only 13%, it's still very low. And, uh, so basically, the, in the book, we argue that Asian economy should maintain good policies that prove to have worked. So I mentioned eight <coughs> policy drivers. And to address remaining and emerging challenges. For instance, I just want to highlight a few. The first is to promote innovation-based growth. Now, you know, most of Asian economies are middle-income economies. And then, you know, Moving from middle income to high income economies, basically you need innovation driven growth. So this is very important. And then second is making growth more inclusive and narrow gender gaps. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, uh, poverty reduction is rapid in a region, but income inequality has been increasing in several economies. So we need more efforts to make growth more inclusive and also gen uh, narrow gender gaps. And the third is improving education quality and achieving universal health care, health coverage. Uh, as I mentioned, the year of schooling has increased significantly in most of the countries, but the quality of education varies a lot. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the OECD PISA test results, right? So we know that uh, there's a large variation across uh, Asian economies, so education quality is the issue. And then the more investment, more public spending on health, to achieve universal health coverage. So the only few countries achieve the universal health coverage. So we need more, we need more. And also we need to reduce large infrastructure gaps. Uh, so of course infrastructure, as mentioned, the significant investment, but still large gaps in the Philippines, for instance, the build, build, build program is very important. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that to, to basically to alleviate uh, bottlenecks. Uh, of the, uh, for the growth, and then we, uh, I, I, did not, I have not mentioned about environment and climate change, this is very important. In the past, uh, you know, half century, Asia growth has been high growth, but environmental protection side 
you know, uh, has been, uh, 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 you know, lagging behind. So we need more efforts, uh, especially also tackle climate change. And then more the increasingly, we have to respond to demographic change and population aging. For the Philippines, this is another issue, but for China, for Korea, for Thailand, for Sri Lanka, these are economies, population aging uh, is become a challenge. Uh, so these are the more detailed discussions on each of the challenges. So I, I, I'm not going to uh, uh, go through because uh, you, you can download, you, 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 uh, we can distribute this uh, PowerPoint. Uh, so let me just uh, go to the last uh, basic summary. So uh, to summarize the issues, uh, issue economic success over much to creating better policy and stronger institutions. And in the book, we highlighted this eight, right? So I've not really repeated the eight policy drivers. And going forward, Asia still face many challenges and there are no room for complacency. So basically, as uh, President Nakao said, Asia, in, in his foreword, he said that we must, Asia must continue to maintain good policy and strengthen institutions. Uh, the former president, uh, Nakao, contributed to development of science, technology, and to tackle global issues. So let me start from here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zhuang, for that very comprehensive presentation. Now we begin with the open forum. Uh, may I request our um, audience to please state um, their names and affiliations before asking the question. So we would like to ask or throw the first question. Yes, sir. Kindly use the mic at the back. Good afternoon. I'm Henry Stipon from Barcelona Heritage and Development Council. Thank you for the uh, achievements of the Asian Development Banks for the last 50 years. Very enlightening. My question is, despite of these achievements, do the ADB have plan of promulgating a new vision and mission for the ADB? Because it was the, I think conceptualized for the poverty reduction. And then now, I think we have achieved so much. If we were able to have a movie out of it, it is no longer a blockbuster. It, the Asian will uh, see it a poverty pornography. Maybe we should uh, conceptualize a new vision mission in line with uh, maybe the Belt and Road Initiative, which is based on infrastructure. Thank you. Are you willing to formulate a new vision mission? So we're going to call, okay. One more question. Okay, yes, sir. My name is Mervyn Salazar from the Senate Economic Planning Office. You mentioned about uh, drivers to growth uh, in your presentations. I haven't seen about uh, the role or to what extent have tax incentives played in, in uh, or contributed to uh, uh, attracting investments in the countries that you have studied on and the, uh, to economic development in general. And also, um, uh, in terms of challenges that Asia uh, is facing, uh, of, I'm, I'm wondering um, what uh, you haven't mentioned about uh, challenges in terms of the regional cooperation among countries in Asia and how it would affect integration in the future given the current uh, issues, um, uh, so, uh, political issues, uh, geopolitical issues facing the region. And also, uh, I haven't seen uh, also uh, challenges that relate to uh, further strengthening our institutions 
um, in, in each country, and of course, uh, those institutions that relate to the uh, co cooperation uh, between or among countries in, in the region. I think that will be all, thank you. Okay, so we'll hear from um, Dr. Zhuang, uh, Mr. Zhuang first, to be followed by um, uh, Dr. Yasu, okay. Okay. It's the other way around. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Qu quickly, uh, so first question is about um, uh, remaining poverty and inequality. And uh, uh, there are two observations uh, closely discussed with um, uh, data um, uh, in the last five decades of Asia. First one is a dramatic de decline in absolute poverty, which is measured by uh, $1.9 per person per day, international poverty line. Uh, and also, it has been a part of uh, um, uh, uh, first generation global goal, millennial development goal, as well as second generation global goal, sustainable development goal. In terms of this absolute poverty, we see a very dramatic decline, uh, but still uh, millions of uh, people in Asia are still under a uh, poverty line. So I think remaining poverty is uh, one issue. And the other thing is uh, uh, overall, we see uh, uh, expansion of uh, inequality, uh, rich and the poor. Although poor is getting richer, but the speed of um, uh, income growth of a rich, rich uh, um, a group is uh, faster than uh, poor. So uh, as a result, we see uh, uh, overall poverty increase. So I think uh, these two things are really uh, the remaining issue. Uh, we need we identify clearly, and also ADB has been working uh, closely. Uh, two years ago, ADB adopted a new 10-year strategy called the Strategy 2030. And uh, in this uh, new 10-year strategy, we uh, set um, uh, seven priorities. And the first, very first pro priority is uh, poverty reduction. So in broader sense, uh, in narrower sense, uh, tackling um, uh, uh, absolute poverty, we have been uh, working on uh, social sector uh, programs. And for example, in the Philippines, uh, actually closely working together with PRDS, we are uh, working on uh, a four-piece program, conditional cash transfer program and also including conjunction CCT program and other broad, broad range of uh, social protection program around the Asian Pacific region we are supporting. And uh, also um, beyond this um, uh, uh, really targeted the poverty reduction uh, programs, education, arena, arena of education and uh, health, uh, uh, we, are, uh, we have a wide range of uh, uh, program projects supporting our uh, client or partner countries uh, uh, government. Uh, secondly, second question is about tax and tax reform. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, we don't have much discussion about the tax reform, but in general, um, uh, 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 government ability to collect the taxation, uh, tax through um, uh, a formal taxation um, uh, uh, program is uh, relatively weak in Asia. So I think it's very important uh, to uh, uh, support uh, tax reform efforts. Again, in the Philippines, you know, uh, uh, market-oriented tax reform uh, train uh, programs are really um, uh, uh, important uh, for government to uh, build up uh, uh, taxation capacity. And uh, ADB has been really um, uh, supporting uh, these uh, market-oriented uh, initiatives. And also, broadly speaking, uh, issue, so-called domestic resource mobilization, this is uh, one area uh, ADB has been working on, and also um, a new uh, president, uh, uh, Masatsuku Asakawa, has been really keen on this, um, uh, uh, you know, strengthening uh, ADB support. Um, uh, so DRM, domestic resource mobilization, taxation issue is really uh, the, the one of the core areas. And uh, um, geopolitical issues, um, uh, I, the final section, si final chapter on regional cooperation integration, we briefly touch upon. Uh, but um, uh, because IDB joke political issues and uh, political economic issues a uh, little beyond uh, uh, coverage of IDB, so plainly we uh, explain what have been happening in Asia. And uh, largely speaking, we see Asia in 1950 and 1960, there are uh, uh, areas and countries and regions under conflict. And um, uh, uh, also, that's uh, one of the reasons why um, uh, uh, people are so pessimistic about Asian development. But now uh, we see a big uh, uh, transformation from uh, battlefield. For example, in the uh, 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 Mekong uh, uh, sub-region area, used to be battlefield, but now it became a very big marketplace. And uh, this transformation, ADB has been really uh, supporting through uh, regional cooperation integration uh, programs and projects. 
and also regional uh, initiatives, uh, ASEAN, and also Greater Mekong Subregions Program, et cetera, et cetera, uh, really um, uh, became a more uh, economy-oriented or development-oriented, uh, 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 you know, uh, cohesive uh, uh, programs. And ADB has been uh, supporting, will be uh, uh, support uh, these programs. Uh, yeah, uh, I just uh, add a few. Uh, I think that the, the we also already mentioned the ADB program, and uh, we are scaling. We have scaling uh, up a landing program or the, the, the priorities. So, so I think I will not add any more. Now, tax incentive. I think is referring to FDI, right? It's not the domestic uh, the FDI. So, if I under my understanding correct. Uh, whether the tax incentive is effective in attracting FDI, I think yes. Uh, so the, all the countries, I think, uh, in the past, uh, uh, you know, uh, they start when they start F FDI, uh, start to liberalize FDI using uh, uh, tax incentives uh, in, in, uh, in Korea, in uh, Southeast Asian economy, in Singapore, for instance, in China. But over time. Uh, in a certain stage, you remove tax incentives. So basically, uh, give equal treatment for domestic firms as well as foreign firms. But initially, I think tax incentives have been used is quite effective. And the issue of institutions, uh, the, we, we did the, the chapter two is about the market, law and the market the state and the institutions. So what we found is that in Asia, you know, we found the government effectiveness and uh, regulatory quality and anti-corrupt control of corruption are very important, uh, very closely correlated with economic performance. So government effectiveness, basically, you need, uh, you know, uh, state capacity is very important. And uh, regulatory quality, because state capacity, you need uh, to implement development of projects, infrastructure, education, for instance. And uh, uh, regulatory quality is important because you need to promote private sector investment, right? And uh, the control of corruption. Well, these are the very important aspects of institutions. Uh, in the past, there are, I mean, normally, there, sometimes there are discussions on uh, issue institution and uh, performance, like uh, kind of the paradox, right? Performance is very good, but institution, if you look at uh, World Bank, uh, uh, worldwide, the governance indicated scores are not very high. So. Basically, but what, what, what we found is that certain aspects is uh, as, uh, institution is very important. Government effectiveness, uh, regulatory quality, and anti-corruption is very important. Quickly, uh, actually a train uh, uh, too, second phase of a train, tax reform is really one of the purposes to consolidate different type of exemptions and uh, uh, programs so that uh, overall tax rate, corporate tax rate will be lower in order to attract uh, foreign direct investment. So I think uh, that's uh, really uh, uh, moving for the right direction, I think. Thank you for your insights. Um, for the second set of questions. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jun Nimirel with the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, uh, House of Representatives. Um, yes, uh, I think uh, I was struck by that uh, what as pointed out in the study regarding the while the uh, private sector and markets are the engine of growth uh, what but uh, more importantly the proactive role of the government is uh, is very critical and uh, i think that's uh, what my question is all about um, how do we really uh, look into the government and see uh, how can we really assess whether the government is um, doing the right proactive role. Uh, because uh, it seems that uh, many of this will be just after the fact. Uh, but uh, while, uh, uh, what would be really the attributes of a government that would somehow assure you that it will be in a position to do a proactive role? And uh, also, what's the role of politicians? What's the role of the bureaucrats? Uh, the civil servants. Uh, is there anything in the study about uh, about the role of the? What is it in the government? Because we're just talking of the government as if it's just one homo homogeneous uh, unit. But uh, I think it's important to dissect what really is in that uh, in that in that government. Because after all, that really differentiates between high-performing economies 
and the low performing economies because after all, the drivers are all the same. It's just how you manage these different uh, drivers, like what you mentioned, sequencing uh, uh, and all those other things. Thank you, Dr. Miral. Uh, we can, we'll entertain another question. Yes, Dr. Kimba. Uh, Francis Kimba of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Uh, may I just want, I just want to hear a further uh, elaboration on the policy driver that was mentioned about uh, reduction of poverty and uh, reduction of inequality, also in uh, improvement in gender, because it appears both as a policy driver and also as an issue that needs to be addressed in the future. So um, how was it a policy driver and what are the issues that Asia needs to address in the future? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kimba. Another question from Dr. Abrigo. Hi, Michael Abrigo from PIDS. Well, uh, I really like uh, the presentations and it looks at uh, the past, but moving forward, uh, we have these big shocks um, in Asia that has affected many countries, including uh, Vietnam War, the Asian financial crisis, the 2009 crisis. Uh, what, moving forward with what we have now with COVID-19, how do you see it would affect Asia, developing Asia, and what should we be doing? Based on, well, at least based on the experiences that we had. Thank you, Dr. Abrigo. So we answer first uh, three questions. We would like to go first. Okay. okay sorry. Yeah, well, let, let me just start uh, and uh, ask him for. So, uh, role of the government. Uh, <clears throat> basically, you see, role of the government uh, in the 50, 60, and the 70. Uh, government in, in South Asia, in China, for instance, right? government is also, in a sense, dominant. Right? So we don't have government it's a, because it's a centrally planned. But it, 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 it just doesn't work, right? Uh, because the private sector was not allowed to develop, right? And controlled, deep, uh, uh, tightly controlled and the market and the no market uh, uh, forces. But after 80, uh, then India and in China all moved towards uh, 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 the uh, market order reform, market-led growth. But the government remained important. But the role of the government now is to support the private sector, rather than to control the private sector. In the past, it's control, right? Now its role is to support, nurture the private sector, and to market to work better, to make a market work better, not rather than disband the market, but to allow to make the market to work better. So that's the kind of role shift. Still same the government role, but in the past, the earliest period is very different from uh, since 80 before, you know, so that. But the government remain important in the sense that because the market alone we know that the market failures, the market failures because of the, uh, uh, because of the imperfect competition, because of imperfect information, and because of externality and the public goods, you know, the kind of need of government, right? So these are the market solution is not optimal, so the government have to intervene. So in that sense, of course, this is very conceptual, but in, 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 in okay, in, in practice, uh, in uh, this, you know, in, in overall that we, we think that way, basically, uh, law of the government uh, important is not to substitute the markets and uh, the private sector. Instead, to support the market, support private sector. But that's a shift. Same market, the government role important, and you can see this, that under two scenarios, the government role is important, but the nature is very different. So the government role is, we think, should support the markets and support private sector. Uh, so in the book, we also highlight the uh, law of the market, uh, law of the government. For instance, the importance of uh, vision for the future. You know, vision for the future, uh, often shared broadly across society, and promoted by forward-looking leaders. Like uh, in Singapore, for instance, Lee Kuan Yew, in uh, Korea and uh, Park uh, Park uh, 
Park Chung Hee, right? And uh, Malaysia from the in the Makia. So these are the visions for the future shared across uh, society and and uh, promoted by forward looking leaders and has has made the difference. And, and also, especially when supported by uh, competent uh, bureaucracy, as you mentioned about government, like bureaucracy, and you know, uh, uh, so these, these these are things uh, we mentioned in 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 the in the in the, in the, in the book uh, made a difference. Uh, so, uh, but of course, the country situation different and details we can discuss. But overall, I can respond. Uh, you know uh, that that. Uh, uh, policy drivers, policy uh, poverty reduction, and uh, inequality gender. Uh, so b b basically, as I mentioned, the uh, issues uh, performance in poverty reduction is very significant, uh, very impressive. Uh, but of course, it remain they are still poverty, right? The, 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 the we in the report we used the 1.9 uh, in like international poverty, one point nine dollar per day per person that, uh, so that, I think we, over time we need to raise the poverty line to 3.2, for instance, that there is uh, poverty. We are talking about extreme poverty. You know, poverty, 3.2 dollar per day per person is internationally, the World Bank recommend is, you know, the poverty line. 1.9 dollar per day per person is extreme poverty. So, so we, have to, we, we, we should not just look at extreme poverty, but poverty, right? So they're still uh, high, the, the poverty rate. Uh, so the poverty reduction, as I said, uh, driven largely by growth, but the uh, policy is important, the land reform and the green revolution I mentioned, and investment education especially, and, and you know, uh, and the promotion of manufacturing, labor intensive manufacturing, that creates a large amount of jobs. That's certainly the case in Korea, in, you know, in, in needs, in a uh, nearly industrialized economy is the case. Uh, 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 gender inequality, as I said, the uh, Asia, uh, uh, earlier stage, okay, in 80, 70, uh, because we have a story of uh, growth with equity, uh, the East Asian economy, uh, you know, especially, uh, basically, eight economy, right? East Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, growth high, but uh, inequality uh, 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 declined or maintained stable. But more recently, inequality is increasing, and uh, so, uh, you know, the not, you know, the inclusive growth. India, for instance, moved to promote inclusive growth in 2006, right, the change of strategy, and China also. Uh, many other countries, many in country economy in Southeast Asia, for instance, Philippines, adopted inclusive growth as a as a goal, right? The uh, develop as a part of a medium-term development strategy. So these are the uh, there, there are things to do. But uh, I think uh, whether we are arguing that these are being noted and uh, that actions are being taken, but of course more needs to be done. Gender inequality, uh, gender gaps declined or significantly, especially in education, uh, in in health, and uh, in labor market. For instance, education now there's gender parity in primary and secondary education, almost all the countries. Uh, may, uh, boy and the girls, the ratio same, same, right? Even some some in secondary school, the gender the girls are more than the girl, boys. Education is good, uh, but of course, tertiary education there are still gaps. Uh, health, uh, maternal uh, uh, mortality rate, for instance, declined significantly. Uh, but uh, there are other areas, the other gender gaps, for instance, in public uh, uh, positions, uh, presentation in the parliament, the political participation, uh, uh, and the employment still, a large amount of females are in informal employment, so that these are the things, uh, uh, you know, and also social norms uh, 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 kind of needs to be worked on, right, uh, in terms of uh, discrimination or against the women, so uh, uh, that, that, yeah. So, and the uh, last, uh, last question, I'm not very clear, uh, so. Uh, what, sh how do we, what are, uh, what, how, wha how do we address the COVID-19 pandemic? Or oh, you mean what, the, the yes. Uh, <laughs> I see, the, I think uh, yes, probably would be better because you are doing. Uh, we are working on a, a policy brief. Yes, can talk about. <laughs> okay.
Okay, thank you. So I, I think Juzon covered uh, almost everything, but just to follow up a few points, and also a COVID ID uh, epidemic. Um, I think uh, first um, 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 a question about uh, government's role. I think, uh, again, theoretically speaking or conceptually speaking, there are market failure, different sources of market failure, um, you know, externality and um, uh, 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 you know, lack of competition, information, frictions, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, government has a legitimate uh, role to correct market failure. But beyond this uh, conceptual issues, I think uh, government should really um, uh, intervene so that uh, uh, market, you know, potential capacity of markets and private sector will be enhanced. So I think um, with this uh, framework, um, uh, having uh, right uh, uh, institutions, public institutions and also public programs are very important. For example, Philippines established the Philippine Convention Commission uh, a few years back, and uh, that's played a very role, very important role to enhance this uh, complementarity between uh, market and government, and also uh, recent uh, tarification of uh, uh, agriculture imports in a quota. I think that's also a very important program to see, you know, maximizing uh, this um, uh, potential uh, capacity of uh, market. And also, um, um, you know, countries in Asia can learn from their peers. Uh, you know, Korea, as I mentioned, Korea or other uh, four tigers and Southeast Asian countries have been really experimenting. And also some programs successful, the other program uh, not necessarily successful. And uh, we see a common uh, uh, kind of uh, element of success that uh, government program uh, is largely performance based and also if government intervene with some uh, uh, restrictions or some uh, regulations, um, um, always government should set a, a sunset uh, plan, clear sunset plan, etc. I think these are the uh, main issues. So peer learning is very important. And second, poverty and inequality. Again, <laughs> Juzong beautifully summarized, but uh, my kind of, uh, beyond this uh, book, my personal uh, observation. So I, I, before I joined ADB three years ago, I have been doing lots of uh, field work and field surveys, field experiment, including uh, villages in Laguna, and also uh, Nueva Ecija, Panayaran, and also still over the weekend, I sometimes go to uh, Payatas dump site, a very low income community, and also relocated community in, uh, called the Casigrahan in uh, Barangay uh, 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 Rodriguez in uh, 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 Rizal province. I see um, this is uh, really uh, consistent with our broader uh, uh, issue. So people, young people, they don't have job. And also, why they don't have job? They often uh, drop out from high school, they enter college, but they couldn't finish uh, uh, college. So I, I think these are the really uh, 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 direct observation. But at the same time, I see uh, a four-piece program, conditional cash transfer program, is really uh, useful for uh, these low-income families to support their livelihood. So I think uh, these are the observations. And also, I often ask uh, restaurants and uh, uh, even coffee coffee boy in uh, ADB. They are very young and very nice, uh, uh, good communicator, uh, shops in Schumacher. I ask, uh, it's a little impolite by us, so they ask you how much you get, and often, uh, they said uh, 500 uh, pesos per day with the uh, SSS and also uh, coverage by, uh, you know, field health. But 500 pesos and these young people, very good, uh, uh, you know, English and the communication ability. Why? I, I, I always wonder why their uh, income is so low. And also, you know, this incident in uh, uh, Green Hills also related to this large labor uh, uh, issues. I think. Uh, in this case, really a labor protection, and a, a market-oriented labor reform, and more structurally um, uh, supporting a human capital investment, these are very important. So related to this, one uh, example, uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh has been a lowest income country, but uh, now Bangladesh growth rate is uh, more than 8%, so it's the fastest growing Asian Pacific region. And also gender inequality was really notorious. But now um, all the education health indicator, gender is reversed. Why this happened? Because of emergence of uh, a ready-made garment industry, labor intensive, kind of East Asian style emergence of uh, uh, you know, uh, pro poor uh, uh, industry, manufacturing industry, absorbing a large uh, majority of uh, uh, young women. 
Uh, of course, uh, we should be care about uh, labor regulation and uh, labor safety issues at, at the same time, but uh, I think a big structural change can happen through this uh, economic transformation. So structural issues, together with also at the in the case of uh, Bangladesh, uh, uh, government adopted the nationwide uh, secondary female scholarship program that also play a very important role. So I think uh, uh, these um, uh, structural uh, reform policies and also facilitating uh, market, uh, power of market, I think that's really key to uh, really uh, 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 change the poverty and inequality. And the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, uh, this is still ongoing and Actually, tomorrow we will release our uh, study results, so I cannot say about uh, some concrete detail, but uh, there are a few channels. Obviously, in China, consumption decline. So Chinese consumption decline means the production also decline. Then, you know, Asian country connected by supply chain network with Chinese uh, production, that will negatively affect it. So this is, um, uh, you know, supply chain, global value chain um, uh, uh, through negative spillover effects. And also, uh, I think um, uh, uh, Chinese tourists are really important uh, customers, a client, coming to uh, uh, you know uh, El Nido and other places, and also Japan, Kyoto, and Tokyo. There are so many Chinese tourists come and uh, uh, spend money. Uh, so this um, decrease in the tourism, outbound tourism, and uh, tourists from China is uh, uh, second one, uh, and also uh, the direct uh, health. Uh, 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 impact is really a big concern. So we're gonna, um, we have been working on what's the uh, likely impact in terms of uh, uh, growth rate uh, decline, not only in China, but surrounding Asian Pacific region, and also what's the uh, level of uh, economic damage caused by this incident. So we will release tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot give you the number, but uh, obviously Philippines and around the uh, surrounding country especially service sector, uh, 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 you know, tourist-related uh, hotels and uh, restaurants, these are negatively affected. But depending on the uh, magnitude, uh, depending on the country situation. Okay. Can I also add, um, in response to Jun's question, um, can we show slide 29? Because I think slide 29 is a good way to answer about the government's role, and also a good way to look at how the Philippines fare in terms of this Eight. So that in slide 29, you have eight uh, uh, things that are the elements of key success. Um, and if you look at it, each of these has a um, role for government. Now, so I think there are numbers here where the Philippine government has done well. For example, uh, maintaining macroeconomic stability. So our central bank in NEDA has done a good, good job of uh, consistently delivering uh, positive economic growth for the last 84 quarters, and that's actually unsurpassed. No, in terms of inflation stability, except for the pre period when rice prices went up, prices was re relatively stable. So I think in this regard, government's proactiveness was actually quite good. The same can be said with open trade and investment. So our tariffs are actually quite low. Financial markets are quite open. I think there's really a little issues in terms of non-tariff barriers, in particular trade restrictions in services, which need still to be open. So there, I think I, I will give a passing mark to the Philippine government, but then caution that uh, services sector needs to be open. I think in terms of building human capital, uh, especially for women, the functional and basic literacy of women are much higher than men in the Philippines. I think. That's the only country in, in Asia where we have really done a good job. So men are actually getting less education in the Philippines uh, than women. So that's actually, I, I'll give the Philippines a passing mark. In terms of investing in productivity, this is actually critical because this is the build, build, build. So for example, from the ADB, since we started up to 2018, ADB has lent the Philippines only 20 billion during that long time period. From 2019 to 2022, uh, our pipeline is that we will uh, lend around 12.2 billion or almost 3 billion a, a year. So this is what uh, I think our Philippine country office is saying, a big bang lending program. So we're ramping up our lending because uh, the target for the build, build, build is about 180 billion over uh, five years. No? 
So that's the total pipeline that the Duterte government is trying to build. So I think in the past, uh, we are actually quite remiss in investing in infrastructure. So I think it's a good, the build, build, build is a good program to really catch up. Now, I think Yas was spoken about the need for structural reform to address number two, because this is really where the bottleneck lies. So for example, in terms of modernizing agriculture, we don't have it, it's not yet mechanized. So how can we move the workers in the agricultural sector to uh, manufacturing without mechanizing it? So for example, in our strategy 2030, I think uh, applying high knowledge in agriculture is one of the target. So applying digital solutions, uh, like for example, AI. So for example, there's a, a, a good example in Indonesia, a fishery sector which uses drones and artificial intelligence to uh, combine the application of fertilizers and uh, control for moisture to deliver high output and then these outputs feed into the market so they can borrow. So this is really creating uh, a, a better value chain for agriculture is very important for this number two. Uh, I'll go back a little bit. I think social inclusiveness for the Philippines, I'll still give the Philippines uh, a fair score. Our gene, gene inequalities relatively compared to other countries are, are quite correct, no? And definitely in terms of engaging with development partners, I think the new government is doing, doing a good job. Now, number one is I think the, an issue in terms of market power because I, I, I tend to agree with uh, the president that there's a large oligarch, uh, if you look at the key sectors in the Philippines like power, uh, telecommunications, there's really limited market players, and even in terms of retail trade, no? uh, compared to Thailand and other ASEAN countries, we ha the number of SMEs in the Philippines is very low, and that's because of very high cost of um, doing business, uh, and also not uh, the lack of uh, market support, uh, finance training. But I think uh, DTI is doing a good job in terms of doing the the new industrial policy. Uh, because the, my understanding of the old, old industrial policy is basically based on a positive list. No? So they have a list of industries that they line up the support, but there's really no integrated approach on how to deliver this uh, industrialization program. So I think the new approach is much more comprehensive. So overall, I think for the Philippines, I'll, I'll, I'll still give the Philippines probably a score of 60%, five out of eight. So it's still passing, but a lot needs to be done. Thank you so much. Um, Ma'am Sel, would you like to add something? Or would you like to comment? Well, actually, I was about to ask our ADB colleagues how they would score the Philippines given this. But James has added, in fact, I, want, I would want to ask both uh, Jujong and Inyasu um, if they were to recommend three, just three major uh, policy reforms or, or programs that needs to be addressed within the next few years, I think, what would they be? Because I, I think we've seen that um, um, the book comprehensively documents what could be done and what has been done and what the high-performing economies have been able to achieve. And the Philippines is performing quite well during in, in recent years. So I guess we would want to have this performance continue um, in the medium term. And so I, I guess that's my question. What would be, if you were to prioritize um, perhaps three um, important policy reforms or, or programs, what would they be? <laughs> so this is a very, uh, very difficult question to answer, but uh, this is my personal view, not necessarily a corporate view. But the first one is obviously uh, human capital um, enhancement or quality improvement. Uh, Philippine, always I, I think uh, Filipino and Filipinas, I feel it's a global talent. Uh, very young, relatively young, and the average age of Filipinos. Philippine people is uh, 28 uh, years old right now, so it's amazingly young. Uh, I'm uh, from a country, uh, super aging society. So whenever I took uh, MRT, I feel I'm the oldest, <laughs> oldest person. In Japan, I'm an uh, average person in a uh, uh, subway. So, but anyway, uh, quality enhancement is very important. And uh, of course, uh, as I said, global talent. Uh, uh, people can speak English, 
uh, interpersonal communication skills, very good. So that's why uh, Filipino Filipina penetrated the global labor market, uh, including uh, cruise ship operators. Uh, by, by the way, a uh, couple of weeks ago, I was uh, having uh, a drinking uh, in a bar in Makati, and uh, a guy ne ne sitting next to said, uh, I lost a job. And it turned out he, he was a cruise ship operator, Teguinshan, because, uh, because of the coronavirus, uh, cruise ship came back to uh, somewhere in the Philippines and uh, uncertainty when they're gonna resume operation. So, but anyway, I think uh, this um, uh, global talent and also at the same time, um, international uh, mass ability, uh, science ability test score, uh, uh, PISA, uh, Philippines not necessarily uh, top listed. So I think that there is a already global talent, but there, there is a room for improving a uh, 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 quality of uh, labor force. Uh, but at the same time, um, Indication, you know, this um, uh, Filipino talent going outside indicates that uh, uh, there's not much uh, uh, good um, uh, employment opportunity domest domestically. Although we see a uh, service sector, BPO sector, um, a business process sector emerging and absorbing, started absorbing a huge amount of labor. And um, I think 50% of uh, uh, labor force in the Philippines now working for service sector and more than 60% of GDP generated by service sector. So we see this um, uh, uh, employment opportunities uh, continuously enlarged within the uh, Philippines, but at the same time, I think the quality of uh, 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 labor opportunity should be improved so that uh, you know uh, supply of uh, a high quality labor force absorbed by a really uh, sustainable industry. I think that's very important. So this is number one, human capital. In order to support this uh, industry side, um, I think uh, competition and fair competition, uh, as uh, uh, James also mentioned, is really uh, one area uh, Philippine can, uh, uh, Philippine government can uh, engage and also ADB can support. Um, uh, indeed, as I said, the PCC has been already established and moving forward the right way. And especially this uh, era of uh, fourth industrial revolution, um, uh, tech giants tended to uh, monopolize the market. So I think uh, uh, free, uh, competition policies uh, really uh, area we need to uh, look into. Uh, so this is a second, and the competition to support the market mechanism. And thirdly, in order, in order to uh, support uh, uh, and encourage the private sector uh, activities and investment, I think uh, physical infrastructure is really needed. And uh, we see daily uh, traffic jam that in case really uh, a transportation infrastructure is a binding constraint and uh, also high um, energy price uh, these things should be uh, 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 really binding constraints should be eliminated so I think uh, largely speaking infrastructure uh, continued infrastructure investments are really critical to support all the continued uh, development and uh, this is also uh, echoed here what James pointed through a build, build, build program uh, I, I think I, I broadly agree with, uh, with what Yasser has said, human capital and competition and infrastructure. But I was also add uh, this uh, social inclusiveness, you know, the poverty and inequality. Yes, uh, as James said, inequality has declined uh, in the Philippines if you look at the Gini coefficient in the last uh, few years. But the still level is still high and uh, poverty level is still there. So, uh, you know, so I think uh, Social inclusive. You see, the income in, uh, in the in the in the report we have a chapter on poverty and inequality. Uh, so on the inequality, uh, uh, we we look at uh, we compare the Asians uh, Gini coefficients and with the, the the other regions of the world. So uh, Asians on average Gini coefficient is a measure of inequality, income inequality, is not high. It's not. Highest, the highest in Latin America, the, uh, Africa, much higher. Uh, but uh, compared to OECD country, for instance, OECD country, the Gini coefficient before tax, before transfers, is very high. Issue actually is lower than that. If you're talking about the before tax, before transfer, but after tax and after transfer, OECD is, is advanced economies. Uh, Gini is much lower. You know, issue is much higher. So there is no, not much difference between the Gini coefficient, the pre-tax, pre-transfer, and post-tax, post-transfer. So that means the redistribution uh, in Asia is much limited. OECD countries 
big role in terms of income redistribution through tax for the transfer, but in Asian country, uh, much smaller. Uh, so that you know, so in that area, the over, of course, that depend on uh, uh, the, the the role of uh, the redistribution uh, uh, to an extent depend on country's level of income. You know, uh, as country become rich and it will increase. But uh, the overall, I think this is the area the Asian country need to do more uh, through uh, tax and transfers to reduce income inequality to make uh, growth more inclusive. I, I think uh, certainly I, I think that applies to uh, the Philippines as well because the Philippine tax revenue as a percentage of GDP, 15%, uh, 16%, uh, is still relatively low. I, I, I think uh, tax, certainly there's a certain room to increase the, the tax, you know, revenue mobilization and as a share of the GDP. And, uh, and then of course tax revenue can be uh, invested in human capital. In human capital investment, you need money, right? So it can be invested in infrastructure, in human capital. So in that sense, public finance, the taxation the system can be improved as well. One more I'll add to what Yasuo and Juzong suggested is, especially for the Philippines, it's really, I think what Yasuo mentioned about the jobs and the future of work. Um, when somebody mentioned that poverty has already been uh, reduced by a lot, my worry actually is it could actually go back because of the changes at the workplace. So at the ADB, we are looking at the features of work because jobs are changing, the requirements are changing, and people that who, are, who, who may not be trained to the new skills may actually lose jobs. So I think that's a very important to really focus on jobs, particularly because unemployment in the Philippines and underemployment is one of the highest in Southeast Asia. So it's, I think there's a structure, structural issue in the labor market that needs to be addressed. Um, and it may also be related to the incomplete structural transformation. So I think that's also important. Thank you for your responses. We are supposed to end um, this um, event by 3.30, so we'll, we are now ready to take the last set of questions. Yes, sir. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the briefing on the contents of the book. Uh, for the publication. My question relates to the issue of labor migration. Uh, I'm, I'm, my name is Sovito Katigbak. I'm from the Foreign Service Institute from the DFA. So it's my job to ask this question. Uh, <laughs> uh, labor migration is very important, specifically because it serves as a catalyst for uh, economic growth in different countries. They, serve, they, they form part of the labor, port, labor, labor force. My question now is, and the Philippine government has been very active in trying to secure or trying to enter into agreements with different countries in terms of protection of migrant workers. Now, the question uh, that I want to throw to the panel is that do the relaxation of border control or uh, migration restrictions, would that be positive with regard to protection of migrant workers or the level of the protection of migrant workers because as based on the Philippine experience, as much as we send so many people outside, specifically in the Middle East region, there is a disparity in terms of the protection that is afforded to these types of workers, especially because they are in household work uh, and because of the value that is attached to their work. So the question that I'm, again, is do freer movement of people or labor or services, would that be beneficial to the level of protection afforded to these labor migrants? Thank you very much. Um, Just your thoughts. Okay, so we're, we're going to entertain two more questions. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. This is Alfie Galaitas from the House of Representatives, Special Committee on East ASEAN Growth Area. Um, I just uh, wonder if there are studies uh, by the ADB on how to lower electricity rates, uh, especially since particularly in 
the ASEAN, uh, the Philippines has second highest, uh, second to Japan. And uh, for the uh, kilowatt hour, per kilowatt hour uh, cost of electricity. And uh, if there uh, has been any study where this recommended to the Philippines, um, and if this were adopted. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Naida Pashon from Save the Children. I think obviously my question would be around engaging with development partners and the role of the private sector in addressing inequality as well as, of course, um, poverty alleviation. So my question really is, has there been some significant changes in terms of how they, this is addressed by the private sector, the corporate, businesses, etc.? And what can organizations like us look forward to in terms of some key changes? Well, of course, obviously, uh, changes that are not related to something like the Napolis case, which actually makes it much more difficult for organizations like us to move and to help those who are less um, who are most deprived. So can we look forward in the future to the Philippines or the rest of Asia being much more philanthropic in nature, particularly corporations and high net worth individuals? Okay. So let's entertain two more questions. Yes, Dr. Justine. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Justine Sikat from the PIDS. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. And this, like with the role of government, is more conceptual uh, a question. As you were looking through prosperity, did you examine if there was evidence of convergence, let's say, in terms of economic growth theory to the steady state, or were there more indications in terms of endogenous growth theory because you highlight the importance of investments in R&D, um, which actually leads to endogenous growth theory. So it's really more of that question. Thank you so much. And uh, VP Ballesteros. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I was just wondering what is the role of uh, participatory governance in, um, in the development of Asia? Uh, because I remember in the 1990s, uh, uh, the development agenda actually was pushing for a greater uh, role of uh, civil society. And um, yeah, and if you look at uh, in, in Europe, for instance, it's the labor unions, workers associations, and cooperatives that has in a way brought up uh, progress, especially in terms of uh, uh, in inclusive growth. So is that not a, a key factor in the case of Asia? So we would like to go first. So we have five questions. So I will directly respond. Um, in the, uh, for the first question about migration, uh, as we are clear, we don't uh, look into the future, but uh, looking back. Uh, 50 years, and uh, we don't have a chapter on migration, although we have uh, some data showing, uh, and books showing that uh, uh, remittance uh, receipts uh, are quite important uh, source of uh, uh, capital inflow. Uh, remittance is not uh, uh, actually uh, capital inflow, but uh, different resources flowing into the countries, uh, remittance uh, play a very important role, especially countries like uh, uh, Philippines. And um, of course, um, um, uh, labor uh, safety and protection, that's the very uh, first thing we have to consider. But I, I, my, my one comment is, uh, uh, as we have seen the transformation from uh, flying wild geese, so-called flying wild geese model of development in four tigers, you know, Japan is a front runner, started from uh, labor intensive products, uh, production, exporting, and then upgrading industry to more capital in intensive and uh, uh, technology in intensive uh, industries, followed by uh, Korea, Taipei, China, Southeast Asian countries. That is a first generation modality of uh, 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 East Asia or Southeast Asian type of uh, development model. But now we see, uh, so in other words, uh, first generation model is uh, inter-industry trade. Okay, so each country, especially in different industry, Started from labor intensive and the upgrading to more capital and technology intensive. 
But actually, what we see is a so-called uh, second unbundling uh, by uh, uh, Richard Baldwin, Professor Richard Baldwin, terminology. Um, so each country produces uh, somewhat similar uh, parts and intermediate uh, uh, products. And then um, uh, each uh, country in Asia engage um, intra-industry trade. So actually, it's not really a clear picture we see right now, uh, like trying to work this model. It's more like uh, noodle ball or spaghetti ball type of a really complicated uh, supply chain network evolving over time. And um, uh, then I think upcoming uh, 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 stage is a so-called third, third un unbundling. Because of uh, uh, internet's communication speed really advanced and the cost dramatically decline, and the video conference and other uh, 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 technology really advanced. So not only industry within the type of a production and uh, activities within the same industry assigned to different country, but now we see uh, job tasks really uh, divided into and uh, people can uh, contribute to some production process by just connecting by Skype and also at home you can work in. So I think uh, this is one uh, sharp development we are seeing. And I believe that will make a dramatic change in uh, migration uh, uh, at, you know, uh, landscape of uh, Philippines. So I think uh, uh, this is one uh, response I'd like to make. You know, we should get prepared. And uh, actually, Philippines has a very good position to really benefit, maximum benefit from this uh, new third unbundling uh, transformation. So that's a one sort of a partial response to the first question. And the electricity uh, prices, um, obviously, uh, there is a quantity versus quality uh, uh, issues. So now we see a very high price in the Philippines, but at the same time, are very stable. I, uh, since I joined ADB three years ago, I almost uh, uh, never encounter uh, uh, blackouts. Although a few years back, I was living in Dhaka, Bangladesh, multiple blackouts per day. So I think uh, stability and quality of <coughs> electricity is another, another consideration. But at the same time, um, you know, lots of technological uh, development in renewable energy that is leading to uh, uh, lowering cost of uh, energy. So I think uh, uh, government should support uh, more competition and, uh, uh, you know, more uh, uh, cost-effective um, uh, source of energy. And um, uh, uh, poverty uh, and the role of a company uh, as a financial or uh, corporate social responsibility. That's a very important area. And um, uh, actually, a uh, few Asian company became uh, really matured enough to provide um, uh, uh, you know, this uh, co corporate social responsibility type of uh, 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 investment and activity. And ADB will also has been also supporting some new innovative idea, for example, gender bond, and also climate uh, responsible bond. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, um, there is uh, some momentum of um, uh, already uh, grown up uh, companies in Asia to allocate more resources in this area. But I think uh, we can use uh, uh, by innovating a new products, a new uh, program to support this um, uh, overall trend. And um, uh, endogenous growth theory, that's a very important and interesting uh, question. Uh, actually, what we see, uh, based on this uh, convergence theory framework, what we see is uh, one set of country converged to US and Japan, so four tigers, okay? So this is a good uh, uh, story. But another set of country seems to be converged to middle point before reaching high income. This is so-called the middle income trap. And uh, countries such as uh, Malaysia and Thailand, Philippines, we don't know yet. We see some middle income trap. And actually, uh, we did um, a thematic uh, study for Asian Development Outlook uh, uh, three years ago, uh, talking about the middle income uh, challenge and middle income trap. Clearly, we show uh, technological advancement overall, either adoption, technological adoption, or uh, own innovation. Overall, technological progress really play a key role for a middle income country to avoid a uh, trap. Uh, so I think in this sense, uh, endogenous growth type of theory, you know, endogenous innovation really play a key role to support the long-term uh, development. So I think uh, this is a very important question 
um, a nice segue in a real world to uh, I mean theory to real world. Final question Final is about is, uh, uh, participation. Uh, participation. Maybe no, uh, participation. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, the, on migration, I just add uh, one more point. Uh, you also mentioned about uh, this bundling, third bundling the opportunities, but also because of the population aging in some Asian countries, like Japan, Korea, uh, uh, the population aging of course, the, uh, in Asia actually the high level of, di of diversity in terms of the demographic change. Uh, Japan, Korea, China, in, as I mentioned, Thailand, in the experienced population aging. But the many economies, Philippines, uh, India, still have a relatively young population. So uh, I think that certainly provides opportunity so that uh, uh, migration, labor migration can benefit both <coughs> groups of countries, right? And uh, uh, so in the report, we, we did, in the book, we did mention, we have a box on that. We say that the regional cooperation uh, can be very useful in terms of uh, making sure that uh, both groups of countries can benefit from labor migration and the importance of uh, protection of basic rights and uh, skill training and education for migrant workers. And, and uh, you know, so, so yeah. But uh, I think we have a particular question on whether the relaxation of a free uh, movement of uh, work will Addressing the protection of uh, migrant workers, I, that, that is more very specific. <laughs> so that is more, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, electricity pricing, yes. Uh, I agree with Yasuo. When I joined ADB in 1997, uh, we, uh, in our commissary, we still have uh, electricity generators uh, for sale. And it will be staffed by generators uh, <laughs> from U.S. to install, you know, at the home, uh, at the house, right? So the brown bag and the, the, the brown out are kind of very common, <laughs> but uh, over time not disappeared, so we never bother about it. So the quality is certainly the liability improved, but the pricing is, uh, is certainly an issue. So uh, I think ADB uh, supported the, the electricity sector in the Philippines. Uh, introduce reforms and the unbundling of the generation from transmission distribution. Uh, so I, I think the key is to introduce more competition, right, to, to make the price down. So competition is the solution. And corporate governance also. Uh, then the issue of convergence you already talked about. Uh, participation, yeah, participation is important. Uh, is a, uh, uh, wider participation, I mentioned the labor union and the civil societies, and uh, you know, so so th that is uh, one important aspect dimension of good governance, and uh, uh, and especially participation is important for social inclusiveness, right? So what we in our study in the book we found that uh, 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 the uh, institutions, these are related institution governance matters for development. Uh, the in uh, at the country at the low income level uh, we're talking about uh, uh, so, so basic governance got governance uh, we uh, can think in terms of as a means as an end itself and as well as a means to growth right so as a means as itself everything all the governance dimension critically important to promote special social inclusiveness the means to growth may depend on the level of development on which dimension we're talking about. Uh, we found the government effectiveness, uh, regulated quality as mentioned, and the contract corruption, very important at the low income level where you need to invest in infrastructure, in education, in promote private sector. Uh, but over time, a uh, country become uh, more developed, participation will become more important, uh, the wider participation, and because the middle class have uh, you know, high aspiration and you know, so, so these are the, uh, how we dis discussed in terms of uh, institution, uh, the importance of institution. Okay. I think that's it, right? Mr. Villafuerte. Um, I'll just add a little bit on the social protection and migration. Um, I think you pointed um, something uh, right that this is happening at the household. My, my, th my thinking is this is happening because there's no information available in the market about the quality of 
the employer and then you have this bilateral agreement between nations about how to protect. I think we need to use uh, technology to provide that information solution because if you look at the platform, you have ratings there, right? So when you sell something uh, or as a buyer, the seller can actually rate you, the buyer can actually rate you. So the platform actually generates information which is very useful for equilibrium. So I think this data can actually, there's a potential to apply technology digitize the information of employers and uh, also the workers so that information becomes available. So I think, I think that's... Okay. So that's our open forum and we'd like to thank the, the, the speakers for their insights, for the comprehensive um, responses to your questions and of course to the active participation of our audience. Now to wrap up our activity this afternoon, may I call again um, Dr. Celia Reyes for the closing remarks. Okay, I, I think we've had a very productive afternoon, very informative and we'd like to thank our colleagues from ADB. Um, and I think what was remarkable about the book was that for me, um, in addition to documenting the journey of Asia to prosperity for the last 50 years, I think it offers us um, a checklist of what else we need to do. Um, and, and this is applicable not just for the Philippines, but for all the countries covered in this. So while the book um, documented, provided us a very good documentation of the I would say success, journey to prosperity by showing us how the Asia share to global GDP has increased significantly over the last 50 years and the reduction in poverty. It has also been able to identify the key drivers in, in being able to achieve this success. And um, I, I think what is also very important is that in addition to this um, policy drivers, by the way, we'll be sharing the we can share, right, the PowerPoint, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that we can look ag again at these um, factors that explains uh, Asia's economic success, the peace and stability, the favorable demographic conditions, the free trade and investment policies in advanced countries, low level income providing potential to catch up, and the better policies and stronger institutions. They were able to identify specific policy drivers, and I don't know whether I put them in a spot earlier, but I think what was very useful was they were able to identify key recommendations for, for the Philippines, and we're hoping that ADB, of course, would be helping um, our government in terms of being able to, to um, address some of these gaps. In particular, our ADB colleagues have um, identified key priority areas where we need to um, put more, e more efforts like investing in human capital to ensure that we improve the quality of our labor force, uh, ensuring fair competition, uh, addressing the infrastructure gaps, um, um, promoting social inclusiveness, and looking at the future of jobs. By the way, I think that's a promotion for our, uh, the work we're doing uh, with, with ADB. PIDES is doing with ADB on the platform economy because we think that this is something that needs to be examined more. There's very big potential on, on the platform economy. And if we're not careful, it could actually um, lead to also um, greater inequality if not everyone is able to participate in or take advantage of the opportunities that this present. Of course, um, um, Dr. Jushan also identified that there's still a continuing debate on whether industrialization can be bypassed. And I think this will be, we're hoping that this could be the topic of their next book and we will have that opportunity again to hear from them whether this is something that um, uh, could really be bypassed because in the case of the Philippines has been cited, Philippines is one of them and India I think is the second example where um, traditionally you would go from agriculture to manufacturing and then to services, but in the case of the Philippines, uh, we've bypassed manufacturing and, and went straight to, um, to services. So um, please join me in thanking Dr. Sawada, Dr. Zhuang, and uh, of course James um, in giving us this opportunity to hear directly from them on the um, highlights of this particular study. So thank you very much.
So that Ma marami salamat po. Yes, maraming salamat din po, sir. So that concludes our uh, event for today and hope to see you in our future activities. Thank you. Thank you.